Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed the first session of the Leveraging Reverse Transcriptase in HIV, Past, Present and Future Virtual Symposium. During the second session, Chloe Orkin and Jean-Michel will give a clinical review on new reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And the toxicity of different drug classes and their clinical implications will be discussed by Laura Waters. And I will emphasize the optimal use of nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors, NRTTIs, and non-nuc regimens in routine clinical practice. The second part of this virtual symposium will also end with a Q&A. During the Q&A, we will discuss your submitted questions. You can submit your questions by opening the Q&A field on the right hand side of your screen. Type your question and press send. Please be so kind to complete the survey after the virtual symposium. We'd like to thank MSD for providing sponsorship for this educational meeting. MSD have had no input into the content or speaker selection of this virtual symposium. Chloe Orkin will review the clinical data on Duravarine, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. She will summarize key findings from recently conducted studies and discuss current guidelines on the use of this novel antiviral drug. Chloe Orkin is Professor of HIV Medicine at the Queen Mary University of London and a consultant physician at Bart's Health NHS Trust in London. Chloe is immediate past chair of the British HIV Association, Vice President of the Medical Women's Federation and a member of the Governing Council of the International AIDS Society. Her specialist interest is antiretroviral therapy. Thank you, Chloe. Hi, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, and what I'm going to do is do a clinical review on the new and exciting reverse transcriptase inhibitor, Duravarin. Here are my disclosures. So what I'll do today is I will cover Duravarin plus NRTIs, and then I'll cover Duravarin plus its new partner, Islatrovir. So I'll start with Duravarin plus NRTIs, and I will cover the treatment naive efficacy and safety first. So uh, in terms of Duravarin, uh, it's a novel next generation NRTI, and it has a unique resistance profile uh, with in vitro activity against wild type HIV-1, and the most prevalent NRTI resistance mutations, which as you all know, are the 103N, the 181C, 190A, uh, and the 138K. And it's dosed once daily without any regard to food. Uh, and one of the unique selling points is that it has a low potential for drug-drug interactions, particularly with commonly prescribed drugs like acid-reducing agents, statins, and metformin. And very importantly, it's been approved both as a single tablet regimen together with TDF and 3TC, and also as a single entity as Duravarin. And that means that it can actually have the versatility to be used with other backbones if necessary. So I'm gonna talk through two large phase three double blind RCTs for treatment naive individuals. And there are 680 people that we are talking about here. The first study is the drive forward study versus Darunavir. Uh, which the top line findings were that it was non-inferior with a superior lipid profile. The next comparator was against Defavarins, and this showed non-inferior efficacy with superior neuropsychiatric and lipid profiles. Now it's important to note that it hasn't been compared against integrase inhibitors, and this is a drawback uh, in terms of uh, comparators. So in terms of baseline characteristics, what I would say is that this particular cohort uh, recruited predominantly male subjects in terms of receiving Duravarin, only 15% were women, and the patients were predominantly white and predominantly had viral loads uh, less than 100,000 copies, almost 80% of the patients. So they, these are important points to note in terms of baseline characteristics. So uh, it's the summary of the clinical efficacy data uh, what I said earlier is that you can see uh, that Duravarin, which is always going to be shown in green, was non-inferior to Darunavir at week 48 uh, and non-inferior uh, to the efavirenz-containing regimen uh, at week 48. 
And if we look at the uh, efficacy data by subgroup, this is really, really important data because what we see here is the stress test of a regimen when we look at the parameters for patients who had high viral loads and low CD4 counts. And what you see for the drive forward study uh, against Darunavir on the left, and the drive ahead study against Efavirenz on the right, is that regardless of baseline viral load, uh, the outcomes were very similar. And we see also that there was no uh, crossing of, of zero in terms of the confidence intervals, for, even for the patients who had low CD4 counts. So this is re really reassuring data uh, in terms of the efficacy of this drug. What about resistance? So it is an NNRTI, and I think there were hopes at the beginning that this drug would be like an integrase inhibitor in terms of resistance, but unfortunately it isn't. So what you see is in terms of those patients uh, who uh, had resistance, uh, there were very small proportions of patients uh, who actually were non-responders uh, in the regimen. Um, but in terms of NNRTI resistance, what you saw uh, for the Derevran regimen uh, was uh, seven patients with NNRTI resistance. Uh, and interestingly, if you compare it to Favarin's, there were 12. So it was about a 0.9% of the patients who had resistance for Derevran. Obviously, we would expect none for Darunavir, um, and we had 3.3% for Favarin's. So you do see a difference in genetic barrier for the second generation drug. But importantly, those patients also had primary NRTI resistance. So what were the mutants? Well, the mutants were uh, the A98G. Um, they were also um, the 227, the 106, the 225, uh, and those were the predominant mutations with the regimen. In terms of adverse events, it's very tolerable. We see for the drive forward study, uh, only 14% of patients had diarrhea. This was the most common event. For the drive ahead study, uh, we see very low rates of discontinuation, statistically fewer than, than with the Favrins. Uh, and we see fewer discontinuations. Importantly, the neuropsychiatric effects against efavirenz were far better, and I'll show you more about that on the next slide. So uh, looking at the neuropsychiatric adverse events uh, at week 48, you see that they were statistically better than efavirenz for dizziness, sleep disorders, and also altered sensorium. So this is a real benefit. In terms of lipids, once, you, once again, you see that for Draven and Green, there were favorable lipids against Darunavir and against Favrins, and you see that some of these parameters were in fact statistically significant, particularly when we're looking at uh, the total cholesterol uh, and the LDL cholesterol, non-LDL non cholesterol. So at week 96, here we're gonna look at the outcomes against Darunavir. And what we see here is that in this study, by this time point, Derevrin was superior. Now, this is something that has been shown in other week 96 uh, studies, that at week 48, it shows non-inferiority, and by week 96, it's superiority. So why does this happen? This is something that happens when there is a real difference in the adverse event profile, and people get tired of adverse events in the second year. So we see this uh, against Darunavir, where ongoing diarrhea can be an issue. Um, but uh, in the study against efavirenz, it remained non-inferior. Now, this is probably because those patients who had significant efavirenz-related side effects, CNS side effects, wouldn't have put up with them beyond the first year and would have been switched. So the main uh, differences were in the first year rather than the second year. So in summary, in the NAIVE trials, Deravrin was superior to Darunavir, non-inferior to efavirenz week 96. There was a 1% protocol-defined virological failure. The lipids remained favorable week 96 for both of the drugs, and the neuropsychiatric adverse, adverse events also remained favorable. Now, this is an interesting little study, the Drive Beyond study, and I bet you very few of you have heard about it. I know that I hadn't heard much about it. So this was a study that was meant to to enroll 60 patients, but in the end, it only managed to randomize 10 patients, and these were patients with baseline resistance. So the aim of the study was to recruit people who had the common NNRTI resistance mutations that Deravrin as a second generation NNRTI is supposed to be uh, sensitive to. However, because they couldn't recruit, they had to discontinue the study early, and we were not going to know uh, whether this actually worked. Um, however, what we can say is that there were some discontinuations, two discontinuations out of the two patients that were enrolled, and actually there, were, there was actually resistance. <laughs> 
So I'm going to move to switch studies. So the drive shift study was the big switch study, and this was a large open label trial switching patients from a stable antiretroviral regimen to Duravarin 3TC and TDF. Patients had to be undetectable for six months, and they couldn't have had any known failure to the study drugs. They had to have a GFR greater than 50 because we're using TDF. They were 80% male and white, median age was 43, and importantly, 70% switched away from a PI, 30% from an NNRTI. Now, 24% of participants had had baseline NNRTI resistance with the mutants that weren't significant uh, for Duravarin, as you can see over there. When we look at the efficacy analysis, and remember we're mainly talking about switches away from the PI, we see that we have non-inferiority. And importantly, none of the participants who received the Duravarin uh, treatment uh, developed viral resistance. So what we're saying is in naive patients, there's a small risk of failure, about 1%. Um, however, um, for those patients who were undetectable, uh, there were no resistance mutations, and that's really reassuring. How about adverse events? How tolerable was it? What we see here is it was really tolerable and the predominant uh, side effect that people experienced was headache, but there were very, very few discontinuations. What about change from uh, baseline in terms of fasting lipids? Well, here we see favorable lipids as we have done in the NIAID studies, uh, predominantly in patients switching away uh, from uh, PI. What about weight data? So weight is a really topical issue and it's something that is really affecting outcomes uh, with integrase inhibitors. And we've seen some quite shocking data this year in terms of weight gain in studies like the advanced trial uh, and, and particularly, but in fact, all of the studies uh, on the Bictegavir program, on the Dolutegavir programs. So what we looked at in this analysis, and this is something I actually presented last year, was the change in body weight from baseline in the first line treatment studies. So what we did in this, in this analysis is we combined all the patients in the phase three studies I've just talked about, and also the phase 2b study, uh, who received Dureferin, and we compared it in terms of the weight gain, uh, weight, mean weight change on the left and median weight change on the right uh, over one year and over two years. And what you see is that these were very, very similar in terms of findings, in terms of weight gain. And in fact, Dureferin was very, very similar at week 96 to Favrin's and to Dubunavir. So this is good news. And if we look at the summary of the weight change category, so the people uh, that, that had less than 5% weight gain or 5 to 10% in, in yellow uh, or red greater than 10%, you can see that these were remarkably similar across the different arms. So this is very, very reassuring because the efavirence is, is generally used as the comparator of choice uh, to evaluate weight gain, particularly in the advanced study. So seeing that Duravarin performs similar to efavirence is very reassuring. What about those who had more than 10% weight gain? Well, once again here, you see that this is incredibly similar uh, between all three of the groups. Uh, I, would, I would point out once again that these were predominantly men, and we do worry more about weight gain in black women, uh, and very few of the people were black women in the study, but nonetheless, this is very reassuring. So here, I'm gonna show you the data from the drive shift study when you switched away from Duravarin. Um, and so we switched to Dreverin away from the, the baseline regimen. So here the data are for uh, between now and from the baseline to week 144. And we're going to look at it in terms of immediate switch group and then the delayed switch group. And we're going to look at it by regimen that they switched away from. So interestingly, what you can see and what is kind of striking is the integrase inhibitor class. So those patients that switched away from integrase inhibitors is at the bottom. And if you look at the weight gain, you see that there was the smallest amount of weight gain for patients uh, who switched to Duravarin away from an integrase inhibitor. Now, this is quite an interesting finding because one of the key questions that everyone is asking me every time I give a talk is, what do you do if you've got a patient who's gained a lot of weight on an integrase inhibitor? Can you switch them? And if you switch them, what would you switch them to? So we're not seeing a weight loss here, but what we are seeing is certainly a much slower rate of weight gain for those people switched away from the integrase inhibitor. So this is certainly something that's interesting and worth investigating in the real world. So the conclusions that I would draw from this study is that amongst virologically suppressed adults who switched to Dureverin 3TC and TDF, the weight gain over one four four weeks was modest. The mean change was less than one kilogram at six months and 12 months after switch. And this is very similar to the uninfected population. 
Uh, over two years, more than two years on Derevin 3C TDF, uh, there was a mean change of weight of about 1.4 kilograms. Um, interestingly, 70% of the participants experienced less than 5% weight gain, and that's consistent with the naive data. And less than 10 had significant weight gain, and again, that's consistent with the naive data. And there was no difference in weight gain by uh, ethnicity, uh, gender, or sex, uh, or, or, or race. Um, and interesting, as I've said, the trend towards less weight gain after switch to intermarase inhibitors versus uh, the other classes. So I do think this is quite an interesting study. Um, and I think we're going to potentially hear more about this uh, in the future. Um, so um, what I want to do now is I want to show you what I've called a miscellany of Derevron. So some other issues. Uh, now, one of the selling points of Derevron is that it's unlikely to be a victim uh, of PK interaction. So what this means is its levels are unlikely to be very much changed by concomitant medications. And you'll see that there are a few notable exceptions uh, that in terms of drugs you would actually prescribe it with. And you can see that it is affected negatively by rifampicin and it is affected also by rifibutin. Uh, so these are problematic uh, co combinations. Uh, you can see that for rifibutin, it's less affected uh, than rifampicin. So it is not the greatest of drugs for TB. And in terms of a perpetrator, in terms of drug side effects that it causes, not very many. So you can see that other than dolutegravir, it doesn't really affect, uh, ad affect PK adversely. So I'm going to move from here to talk about uh, the use of Derevron with this latrivir. So at the moment, there are phase three trials looking at Derevron together with Islatrovir. So Islatrovir is a novel NRTTI, so a nucleoside reverse transcriptase uh, translocation inhibitor. Uh, and it is a very potent drug. It's potent at picomolar concentrations. And it's being developed in a number of ways. It's being developed as an oral tablet together with Derevron, which is what I'm going to talk about. But beyond this, it's also being looked at uh, as a once weekly agent. Uh, and potentially as an implant. So it's a very versatile compound. But where we've got to in terms of using, using this drug uh, at the moment is there's a phase 2b dose ranging study of Derevron together with this latrivir of about 120 patients, 90 on Derevron at the different doses. So what we see here is the primary, end, primary outcomes in terms of efficacy through week 48. Uh, so what we see in the different doses of Islatrovir in the blue and in the red uh, is really good outcomes in terms of the snapshot with very few failures. So this is reassuring and good news in terms of the drug. Uh, if we look at the failures, uh, viral load greater than 50, it's really important to understand these. Uh, and this is an analysis that I presented uh, this year at AIDS 2020 virtually. Uh, and what we see here is across the three different doses, uh, there were four people who were bounded with viral loads greater than 50 on, the, on, on that group, and there was one non-responder in the 2.2.5 milligram dose. There are a couple of early discontinuations who weren't classified as failures, PDVFs, but nonetheless discontinued early uh, due to withdrawals and incarcerations and various factors. But importantly, amongst the PDVFs, um, in terms of virological failure, none of them had confirmatory viral loads greater than 80, and none met the criteria for resistance testing. And the PK was, was pretty good for all of these patients, so that's interesting too. If we look at the viral loads by study visit, there you see this uh, in terms of the yellow, those all of the patients failed with viral loads less than 200, and the confirmatory values were also less than 200, as you see there. Um, what were the most common adverse events with this particular combination? So like I mentioned in the drive shift study, you can see uh, for the combined dislatrivir doses in the white column that headache was the commonest, and this was more common than with Derevin 3TC TDF. You can see diarrhea was similar, and you can see nausea was similar. Um, there were no other really significant adverse events of note, and these adverse events that I'm presenting to you here were adverse events with an incidence of greater than 10% in any group. So one of the important parameters always is the, is the metabolic parameters, uh, and what you see here for the different groups versus TDF 
uh, group uh, is that uh, the, the cholesterol ratios uh, and the, the, the were all good uh, and the glucose was good. Now we must remember that uh, the advantage is actually to the TDF containing arm because we know that TDF has this magical weight loss inducing and lipid lowering property. So it's actually reassuring to see that without the TDF on the 2DR arm, uh, the outcomes were actually excellent too in terms of the metabolic parameters. Now we come to weight. And as I've said to you, this is the hot topic of 2020. It's the hot topic of 2019. So what we want to understand here is what was uh, the, well, firstly, uh, what was the weight percentage change from baseline uh, and how many people had more than a 5% increase. Uh, so I remind you that the Derevran 3TC TDF comparator is in gray. So what you see is numerically, it is looking slightly higher for the three uh, groups with this latrivir. But if you look on the table on the right, and I do think this is a very interesting finding, the Islatrivir combined arms is the second to lowermost row on the right hand table. And if you look at week 48, you see that 37.8% of people had more than a 5% increase. And if you look below at the Doravarin 3TC TDF, you see that it was 22%. Now this was something that was not focused on at the AIDS 2020 meeting. And this is because the numbers are small and we're only looking at a phase two study. However, I would conclude that actually I would notice that there was a difference between the NRT, you know, the NRTI TDF containing three drug regimen and the novel combination of Doravarin and Islatrivir. So with that, I'm going to conclude here. We are on an online webinar, um, but I'd like to conclude and say thank you very much uh, for listening. And I hope that this has been informative for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chloe. Now, new reverse transcriptase inhibitors, including, including the novel nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitors, are emerging options for both treatment and prevention of HIV infection. During his talk, Jean-Michel Molina will present the most recent clinical data on the potency, safety, and pharmacokinetics of these new antiretrovirals. Jean-Michel Molina is Professor of Infectious Disease at the University of Paris and Head of the Infectious Disease Department at the Saint Louis Hospital in Paris, France. Jean-Michel has been an investigator for many clinical trials of novel compounds and combination therapies. He's a world authority on the prevention of HIV infection with antivirals and has led the ANRS IPAGE pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP trial in men who have sex with men and now a new ANRS PrEP study, the ANRS Prevenia study. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to uh, be part of this symposium today. And I've been asked to review for you uh, the current data on a new drug for HIV treatment and prevention is Latravir. These are my disclosures. Islatravir is a nucleoside analog uh, which inhibits the HIV reverse transcriptase with a novel mechanism of action. And that's why it is called a reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor or NRTTI. You can see here the chemical structure of um, Islatravir formerly known as EFDA or MK8591, which is an adenosine analog with an hydroxyl group here, which uh, is found in natural nucleotides and has a very high binding affinity for the HIV RT. There is also an ethanol group here with uh, the ability to block translocation and cause immediate chain termination. In addition, there is a fluoro group which can inhibit this latrovir metabolism and contribute to its long half-life. In vitro, this latrovir has a very low IC50 in the nanomolar range uh, with a concentration of this latrovir triphosphate, the active compound in uh, PVMC. In the macaque model, the uh, IC50 of uh, Islatravir is also quite low in the pico molar range. Interestingly, Islatravir has no or very weak inhibition of human DNA polymerase, alpha, beta, and gamma, which is relevant for um, a low potential for mitochondrial toxicity. The half-life of Islatravir triphosphate in uh, healthy adults in PBMC 
is uh, on average 120 hours, which is uh, quite longer than uh, the uh, half-life that we know for tenophovir trifles. This slide shows you the uh, in vitro activity of Islatravir on different HIV subtypes. Uh, and you can see that the uh, phenotypic susceptibility uh, as compared to uh, laboratory HIV strain remains uh, below one, suggesting that the activity is retained in all these HIV-1 subtypes. As uh, we know um, for uh, the other NITIs, the WD, Tenofovir, and Lamivudine. Interestingly, Slatravir has also in vitro activity against HIV-2, but no activity against HPV. And this is uh, something we may uh, need to recall when using uh, this drug in the clinic. This slide uh, shows you the in vitro activity of Islatravir using the monogram phenosense assay on different HIV strains with uh, different types of NATI uh, resistant mutations. And you can see that as compared to the white type strain, when you look at strains with the M184B mutation, you have a five-fold uh, increase in um, uh, the uh, uh, phenotypic uh, uh, assay with an, uh, an increase in the IC50, uh, which uh, remain uh, quite low at one nanomolar. On the other hand, with the uh, Q151 mutation, uh, the fold change is below one, which uh, can be uh, translated as a hypersensitivity or susceptibility of the strain to Islatra here, which is quite interesting. However, the 69 session is associated with a tenfold uh, change increase uh, in the uh, monogram assay, uh, with still an um, IC50 at two uh, nanomolar. With a more frequent mutation, P65R, again, as you can see, the full change uh, in phenotypic susceptibility is below one, which again is in favor of an hyper susceptibility of this strain to a slot review. However, three times uh, combined increase the full change threefold. And uh, three times plus the MYT4V mutation, you also uh, increase uh, the phenotypic susceptibility by uh, 11 fold with an IC50 remaining in the range of 2.2 nanomolar. Another way to look at this data is to plot the IC50 in the y axis, and uh, on the x axis, you have different strains with different mutation. And you can see that although uh, the uh, Islatravir here with the blue spot at the lowest IC50, uh, uh, the IC50 is higher when you have the uh, uh, 69 insertion of uh, uh, combination of TAMS plus uh, M1E for V mutation. The first data in uh, HIV infected uh, patients uh, come from this uh, phase one study recently published in the Lancet HIV, where 30 treatment naive people uh, received a single dose of Islatravi ranging from 0.5 to 30 milligram. And you can see that there was a um, decline by seven days of HIV RNA as compared to baseline by at least one log, which is quite nice, with no emergence of viral resistance. And in terms of safety, uh, the only drug-related adverse events were headaches in six individuals and diarrhea in two. There was no uh, SSDs. This study was an opportunity to look at uh, PK in uh, those patients. So when you look at plasma PK, you can see that the AUC increases with a nice uh, dose proportional increase. The Tmax is uh, reached after 30 minutes to an hour. And when you look at the slaterovir triphosphate levels in PBMC, you can see again that the PK increase is dose proportional. And after seven days, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, Islatravir triphosphate concentration remains above 0.1 picomol per uh, 10 to the 6 PBMC. Interestingly, the half-life uh, is in the range of 120 hours, which is uh, uh, an interesting attribute of this drug. Another way to look at this data is to correlate uh, the uh, Islatravir triphosphate concentration here on the x-axis with the viral load decline, and you see a nice uh, correlation. Uh, 
with greater decline with uh, increased estatory triphosphate concentration. And these data were um, used to try to define the threshold of estatory triphosphate concentration in EBMC. And you can see that this threshold of 0.05 picomol per 10 to the 6 cells was uh, defined as a threshold associated with the decline in viral load of at least 0.5 log here, the black dots, but in some individuals up to 1.5 logs. Interestingly, uh, islatravir triphosphate concentration in rectal and vaginal tissues were similar to those seen in PBMC, which is interesting when we will discuss later on uh, the use of islatravir for prophylaxis. If we uh, now look at another study um, conducted uh, with the use of islatravir given weekly, uh, and you look at PK concentration, again, of islatravir triphosphate in PBMC, you can see that even at the lowest dose used, 10 milligram weekly, after a week, uh, the uh, trap levels were above the threshold here of 0.05 picomol. And when the uh, patients received three doses of islatravir after week three, you could see that uh, a week after the first, this third uh, administration, concentration remained uh, way above this uh, threshold. But that was true also a week later, which is important regarding forgiveness uh, when we will use this drug on a weekly uh, regimen. And that's the reason why uh, islatravir right now is uh, considered for development for both treatment, even once daily in combination with the rubbery, or once weekly in combination with another and an ATI. Um, it is also being developed as a, a drug for prevention uh, for PrEP, even once monthly, and potentially even once yearly, uh, if uh, we can use this drug uh, in um, an implant. Let's look first at the data for the treatment of HIV infection. Uh, and these are data when Islapravir is used in combination with the Ravirin, given uh, daily. So this was a randomized placebo-controlled study, which results have been presented uh, in Mexico last year. So these treatment-naive patients with a CD4 cell count above 200, no ART uh, resistance mutations, and no uh, active hepatitis C or B. And these individuals were randomized to receive for the first 24 weeks Islatravir uh, in combination with the Ravirin and 3TC at three different doses of Islatravir, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 2.25 milligram QD. Or uh, in the control arm, patients received the Ravirin, 3TC, and Tenofovir. In the first three arms, if the viral load was uh, below uh, 50 copies at week 20, the patients were switched to the dual regimen of Islatravir and the Ravirin up to week 48. After which, the dose uh, of Islatravir was selected for um, the maintenance part. Interestingly, the stratification for randomization was uh, made on HIV arena level and uh, below or uh, above 100,000 copies per ml. In terms of uh, baseline characteristics, you can see that almost all patients were male, uh, pretty young, 28 years of age, mostly white, with a CD4 cell count above 400 and a median plasma HIV RNA of 4.6 log. But you would appreciate that uh, when you look at the patients with the highest viral load, above 100,000 copies per ml, the proportion in the islatory arm was a little bit higher, 20 to 29%, as compared to only 16% with the rivalry, 3TC and tenofovir. Let's look now at the mean log change from baseline HIV RNA at the time. And at week uh, 48, you could see that in all groups, there was a nice decline by uh, on average, three logs of this uh, uh, HIV RNA. The primary end, uh, end point of this study was uh, at week 48, the proportion of patients who achieved uh, less than 50 copies of plasma HIV RNA. And you can see that overall response rates were high in all groups. When you look at the proportion of patients with the viral load above 50 copies at week uh, 48, it was, uh, again, similar uh, in all groups, except maybe in the high-dose Islatravir group, where uh, four patients uh, out of 31 had a viral load above 50. But when we look at the patients who had the protocol-defined virologic failure at week 48, you can see that only 
one to two individuals per group reached this definition of biologic failure, which was quite conservative since it was based on a confirmed HIV RNA above 50 copies. So if uh, your patient had a rebound of HIV RNA above 50 copies, you had to discontinue study drug and to switch to triple regimen. What is, is interesting to note is that in all cases of PDVF, the viral load remained below 80 copies. So no one reached the 200 uh, copies threshold that would allow for uh, genotypic resistant testing. And in addition, when uh, the patient switched to the triple regimen, five out of the six patients had their viral load back to less than 50 copies at the time of the switch. Also, uh, the PK of isoprevir in uh, those people who had PDVF was similar to the other participants. So it's not a PK issue here that was responsible for these uh, PDVF. The CD4 cell count changes from baseline was, uh, as expected, uh, quite significant in all arms, although here at week 48, a little bit lower with the high dose of Islatravir. And in terms of safety, uh, it's interesting to see that when you look at uh, drug-related adverse events, the proportion was actually higher in the control arm as compared to the combined Islatravir arm here. 19.4% uh, versus 7.8%. And that overall, only two individuals discontinue Islatravir uh, deriverin because of a drug related adverse event. One individual had uh, GI symptoms at uh, day 200, and another one had an HPV reactivation at day 200. If we look at the most common adverse events reported during these first 48 weeks, um, you can see that headaches were reported more frequently with the Slatravir as compared to uh, the control arm. But diarrhea were more frequent with uh, the control arm of uh, Duravirin 3TC Tenafavir as compared with the Slatravir Duravirin. And nausea were reported in 9% uh, 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 in uh, all groups overall. Lab abnormalities were quite infrequent and uh, again similar across all groups. Um, with uh, two individuals here having a grade three uh, increase in uh, triglycerides and uh, a couple of people with increase in creatine kinase, uh, which actually resolved spontaneously and most of these individuals had, uh, had uh, physical exertion that may have explained this increase in creatine kinase. When we look at other metabolic parameters, so glucose level here on the left-hand side, very minimal changes over time and no significant differences between the, the groups. Interestingly enough, in all groups, there was a decrease in the total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio, which is quite a good thing. Let's look now at uh, weight changes from baseline in these individuals. Uh, what you can see here is the percent change from baseline in body weight. Uh, and you can see on this graph that the body weight increases over time, uh, mostly during the first 24 weeks, but also at week 48. And in this table, you have here the proportion of patients who had more than 5% increase from body weight uh, since baseline. And you can see that this proportion was 22.6% with uh, the Ravarian 3TC Tenafavir and 37.8% with the Islatory arms combined. So this is something we, we may need to continue to monitor in future studies with uh, uh, Islatravir Duravirin. So in conclusion, this uh, phase two study shows you that uh, patients who initiated treatment with Islatravir Duravirin and 3TC and switched to Islatravir Duravirin once the viral load was below 50, uh, maintained this high efficacy at week 48. Uh, the safety was also uh, pretty good with only two participants discontinuing uh, the study drug because of adverse events. And so uh, these results were good enough to continue the um, investigation of these uh, new drug in phase three trial. And you have here a list of phase three trials which have started in heavily treatment experience, in virologic suppressed patients, or in treatment naive patients, both adults and adolescents. And in all trials, uh, the combination tested was the Ravarin 100 milligram and Islatravir 0.75 milligrams per day. But as I told you uh, at the beginning of my talk, Islatravir has also the potential to be used for prevention. 
And this is a study done by uh, Martin Markovitz group, uh, recently published, where they use their macaque model uh, with uh, sheer rectal challenges every week. And they uh, gave uh, macaques uh, islatravir uh, a week before each uh, challenge. And when they used dose of islatravir at 3.9 milligram per kilo in these macaques, as you can see here, there was full uh, prevention of uh, sheep infection in all these animals. They went, decreased the, the dose of islatravir, and they showed that at doses as low as 0.1 milligram per kilo in these animals, they were able to prevent sheep infection in this uh, rectal challenge model. And this is, of course, relevant to uh, the use of islatravir in humans. Another interesting way of using islatravir for prevention is the use of islatravir implants. And Merck uh, is uh, using uh, the technology they, they know uh, for uh, next planon, their contraceptive implants. And they were able to uh, insert islatravir in these uh, implants. And you have here an X-ray computer tomography a picture of islatravir implant. And you know that the next planon implant is four centimeters in length and um, is, uh, an interesting uh, way of uh, uh, prevention uh, for the future. You have here a simulated PK uh, profile of uh, islatravir when used in an implant. But uh, more recently at IES, uh, PK data in uh, individuals uh, who had this implant inserted were presented. And when the uh, implant contained 62 milligram of islatravir, you can see that over time, uh, up to 12 weeks, uh, the uh, islatravir triphosphate concentration in PBMC was above the target concentration of 0.05 picomol per 10 to the 6 cells. And when the implant was removed, the concentration was still above this threshold for uh, the next three weeks. And uh, at Merck, they simulated actually the PK of islatravir using this implant if the implant was not removed after 12 weeks. And they showed in this uh, graph that uh, um, in their model, actually, uh, concentration of ethylene triphosphate above the target concentration was uh, probably maintained for uh, uh, nearly a year. And of course, that's quite exciting uh, when you think of uh, being able to prevent HIV infection with an implant for a year. More provocative is the use of islatravir for PEP. And in the same macaque model, uh, Marty Markovitz and colleague uh, presented at Coriolia this year, the use of islatravir uh, given 24 hours after an HIV uh, sheave uh, IV challenge in the macaques. And you can see here that uh, using a single dose of islatravir uh, 24 hours after the uh, IV sheave challenge, they were able to protect four out of six animals. But when they repeated the islatravir dose uh, with two doses of islatravir, three or uh, four doses of histatravir, they were able to protect all animals in, in this model. So that's also quite interesting to, uh, uh, in the future, maybe you look at this uh, strategy for PEP. So in summary, histatravir is a new, uh, an TTI drug with unique features. Uh, preliminary data are quite promising today, even alone or in combination with the Ravarine for the treatment, but also the prevention of HIV, PrEP, and potentially PEP as well. The safety profile so far looks good. We have multiple delivery options with Islatravir. It can be given orally, daily, weekly, even monthly. It can be used also as an implant. So uh, this uh, drug uh, you know, has a, a lot of potential, and there are more data to come. So stay tuned to know more about Islatravir. Um, I'd like now to finish up by acknowledging uh, my colleagues at the San Luis Hospital and all our uh, funders, and in particular, the uh, ENRS in France. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Jean-Michel. Now, toxicity of different drug classes and their clinical implications will be discussed by Laura Waters. Dr. Laura Waters is a GU HIV consultant and HIV lead at the Mortimer Market Centre in London. She's president of the British HIV Association, BEVA, and on the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV, BASH, board, and chair of the BEVA Treatment Guidelines, 
She's previous chair of the BASH HIV Special Interest Group and has co-authored several national guidelines. Laura represents Beaver on the HIV Clinical Reference Group, advising the NHS in England on HIV treatment and care. She's published widely, writes a regular column for the Boys Magazine, and is a Terence Higgins Trust trustee. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Waters from the Mortimer Market Centre in London, and I'm talking about toxicity and clinical implications of different drug classes. These are my disclosures. Now, when I saw the title of this talk for 15 minutes, I did panic somewhat. What do I choose? There are so many classes. There's so many toxicities we could discuss. But then I remembered it's a reverse transcriptase symposium. So I'll be focusing primarily on the class toxicities associated with the nucleoside and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. I'll also touch on the other major drug classes in current use, protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. So starting with NRTI, and I think this class exemplifies more than any other, the evolution from ugly duckling to swan. If we look at the pre-heart NRTIs, this is the NRTIs developed before the mid-1990s, we had the evolution from zidovudine in 1987 through to didanosine and zalcitabine, stavudine, and then finally lamivudine in 1995. Now, the issue with this drug class was primarily related to toxicity secondary to mitochondrial dysfunction. And this was driven by impaired mitochondrial DNA production secondary to the inhibition of polymerase gamma by NRTIs. Polymerase gamma is the human polymerase most affected by NRTIs and mitochondrial dysfunction can result. And this is where it gets quite interesting from a pharmacological perspective, because if you look at the different chiral forms of the same drug, taking lamivudine as an example, the negative chiral form of lamivudine has much less affinity for polymerase gamma than the positive, yet the same impact on reverse transcriptase. So this is the version that was developed and is the 3TC we know and mainly love. Also, it depends on how well the NRTI is excised from that polymerase. So after binding, lamivudine is excised much more efficiently than zidovudine, for example, which once bound that polymerase, pretty much stays stuck there. So it's the affinity for polymerase and the rate of removal that are important. The other key thing are the tissues affected. So if we think back to some of those classic signature NRTI toxicities, such as lipoatrophy associated with zidovudine and stavudine, that was due to mitochondrial toxicity of fat cells. And some of those classic toxicities varied according to propensity for particular cell types. What about the post-heart NRTIs? And here we have abacavir, tenofovir DF and emtricitabine, and then a large gap until tenofovir AF, which was licensed in 2016. These are the European licensing years. And again, from a pharmacological perspective, this is interesting. So emtricitabine is modified 3TC with the addition of a 5-fluorinated cytosine. And what that means is it has less affinity for polymerase gamma, which is already low, and slightly more reverse transcriptase affinity, which may account if we're splitting hairs for a slightly higher genetic barrier in clinical studies. Moving on from mitochondria, though, abacavir was a very interesting drug, of course, used less today. And it actually has a low propensity for mitochondrial toxicity. So here new mechanisms emerge. The classic toxicity of abacavir hypersensitivity, which is a delayed type reaction, occurs in people who carry the HLA-B5701 allele. There have been no proven, and that means patch test proven, abacavir hypersensitivity reactions in people who are negative for this allele. And this remains one of the best examples of successful use of pharmacogenetics in clinical practice. Cardiovascular disease is the other, albeit debated, toxicity associated with abacavir, although I think most agree there is a signal. And the studied mechanisms include endothelial dysfunction and vascular inflammation. And actually, structurally, abacavir is very similar to some of the endogenous purines which are involved in signaling and can be prothrombotic and pro-inflammatory. The other well-studied mechanism is platelet aggregation, and by more than one mechanism, abacavir makes platelets more sticky. Tenofovir DF, I won't go into great detail here. I'm sure you'll be familiar with the classic toxicity profile for TDF, 
but renal toxicity, which can be a chronic kidney disease or a proximal tubulopathy type. The mechanism isn't entirely understood. It's possibly due to mitochondrial toxicity. And although TDF has a low affinity for polymerase gamma, the renal proximal tubule is particularly sensitive to mitochondrial toxicity. But we do know the renal toxicity correlates with plasma exposure because we see more with boosters, which increase plasma and intracellular tenophobia exposure. And also there are some pharmacogenomic associations. Bone mineral density loss is the other classic adverse event. The mechanism is not clear. It may be mitochondrial and may be related to low grade renal phosphate loss. I think one of the key things to point out, though, is most of the evidence for TDF and bone loss is based on DEXA. And DEXA cannot distinguish osteomalacia from osteoporosis. And that led to a conundrum for many years. You had the renal and bone concerns for TDF and the cardiovascular concerns for abacavir. But then, of course, along came the AF, the angel NRTI, that would be associated with far less toxicity. And when it comes to renal and bone markers, that is indeed the case. But is TAF truly an angel? And I think there are still some issues potentially related to very high intracellular concentrations in some cell types in animal studies, including pulmonary cells. There have been case reports, albeit very few, of nephrotoxicity, because ultimately tenofovir is still the active drug. TAF has a suboptimal lipid profile compared to TDF. And in the Tango study, which was a switch study for people suppressed on TAF-based three drug regimens, randomized to continue or to switch to dolutegravir and ibudine dual therapy, there were lipid improvements, which were most marked if they were on a boosted regimen at baseline. So removing TAF and a booster and switching to dolutegravir and ibudine improved lipids. The HOMA IR, a mechanism of insulin sensitivity, improved significantly if people on a booster and although it wasn't significant, there was still a trend if they were on an unboosted TAF-based regimen. So possible differences emerging here between a TAF FTC and a lamigudine backbone. Weight, of course, has been the big story. I won't go through all the data, but this was presented in the summer by Paddy Mallon, the US Opera cohort. And here people switching only the TDF to TAF component of their suppressive art saw a sudden upswing in their weight trajectory at the time of TAF switch. We have the advantage of pre-switch weights here and prior to switch an annualized weight gain of 0.4 kilos, which went up to 2.64 for the nine months surrounding switch and then plateaued at an annualized weight gain of 0.3 kilos per year. Now these lipid changes and weight changes uh, when switching from TDF to TAF may be associated with an increase in estimated cardiovascular risk. This was illustrated in this retrospective US cohort of 110 people. And the key message is BMI, lipids, and the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score all increased on switch from TDF to TAF. But it's important because if you use a cardiovascular risk calculator based only on lipid ratio, you may miss changes in LDL that would affect risk using other calculators like ASCVD. Now this year we actually saw some clinical endpoints. This is a ne Netherlands retrospective cohort looking at emergent cardiac events. People on TAF had significantly more new cardiac events on people on TDF or people on no tenofovir at all. The difference between TDF and no tenofovir was not statistically significant, but the difference for TAF compared to both of those groups was. Now they controlled for various factors such as gender, smoking and previous cardiac history, but they were not able to adjust for renal impairment. And clearly that's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and a driver of being on TAF. So more work is warranted, of course, but this is a signal worthy of some caution at the moment, I think. So the final question for this class, what about our next NRTI, which of course, as you know, is an NRTTI, is Latrovir. Of course, we don't know much yet. It's not been studied widely, but it's important to point out here, this study showed it has a very low propensity for interactions with polymerase gamma. So it's going to look pretty clean from that perspective. What are the clinical implications finally? Well, most old NRTI are no longer in use. Lamifudine is considered pretty inert, such that we're very happy to include it where it may offer some activity, even in the presence of resistance. B5701 testing is now standard prior to abacavir use, and abacavir is not recommended for people with high cardiovascular risk. 
TDF isn't recommended in people with renal or bone disease or at high risk of either of those, but I think to a degree it may be unfairly demonised, except in England where we love using TDF, because certainly if you use it in the right people with unboosted third agents, it appears to be fairly safe. TAF is considered a safe option, but the question, is it really? And I think we need to understand more about the impact of lipids, of weight, and this possible signal related to cardiac events. Moving on to NNRTI, the first generation NNRTIs were licensed in the late 1990s, and nevirapine was actually a very good drug once you were stable on it. And after three months, it has a very good toxicity profile, but its use is limited by severe hypersensitivity with up to 1% of people developing a severe rash and hepatic hypersensitivity, which can be fatal. It's an immune mediated hypersensitivity related to CD4 with a higher risk at higher CD4 counts and some HLA associations, though the studies proving this tend to be small and the associations are weak. Ifavarin is also associated with rash and hepatotoxicity, though to a lesser degree than the barapine, and most people with Ifavarin's rash could be treated through it. But the hallmark toxicity, of course, is neuropsychiatric. This is likely a direct neuronal toxicity effect, um, and there have been a number of mechanisms postulated, including calcium channel pathways and cannabinoid pathways. Immune-mediated hepatic injury is uncommon, but hyperlipidemia is common. It's important, however, to note that in the DAD studies, which first showed us about the abacavir and cardiovascular disease risk signal, these NNRTIs were not associated with elevated cardiovascular risk. So moving on to the second generation NNRTIs, Itraverine, licensed in 2008, also associated with rash and transaminitis, though to a less severe degree, certainly than nevirapine, and a better lipid profile than efavirenz. And those, there was, though there was some improvement this was still consistent with a rash and hepatitis NNRTI class toxicity. But then Rilpivirine in 2011 with much lower rates of rash, 2% compared to 13% on eflavirins in the registrational studies, less transaminitis in those same trials, relatively lipid neutral and really no signature toxicity. So this second, second generation NNRTI really shifting along and moving away from those NNRTI class effects. And then finally, of course, we have our third generation NNRTI Duravarine. Now, these are the structures. I'm no pharmacology expert, really, but you can see the structure of Duravarine is, is very different to the second generation and to Efavirin shown here. That to me means it's likely to behave differently. And certainly if we look at rash, it's less common. And importantly, in the drive ahead study, the first line comparison with Efavirin, there were no rash related discontinuations on Duravarine compared to almost 3% in the Efavirin arm. Uh, liver toxicity from the liver tox database, there are no reports of clinically apparent hepatotoxicity. Transaminitis is rare, although more common, as you would expect, in hepatitis B or C co-infected patients. And finally, from a lipid regard, and here again, the head-to-head -head comparison with the Favarin's first line, you can see a really optimal lipid profile with a reduction in LDL, total cholesterol and triglycerides. So clinical implications, NNRTI class toxicities were primarily associated with the first generation and itraverine. One caveat, though, is the itraverine registrational studies were in highly treatment experienced people and often combined with many other drugs, which can, of course, cloud the interpretation. Rilpivirine and Duravirine have good safety profiles, but there is a lack of long-term cohort data for our newer NNRTI, so vigilance and reporting are still key. Protease inhibitors, we have one slide, a message. The old ones were horrible, the modern ones are better, but issues include an association with chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal toxicity, and although the new ones are better than the old ones, they are still worse compared to other classes. And of course, the indirect toxicity associated with boosters and drug-drug interactions. The clinical implications are that PIs still have a role, but really they're an exception rather than first choice. And of course, we should endeavor to switch to non-boosted options where there are reasonable alternatives. Finally, integrase inhibitors. And you can see the timeline here for raltegravir through to Bictev Bictegravir um, over an approximately 10 year period. Now, one of the initial toxicities associated primarily with raltegravir was myotoxicity, although that's thankfully uncommon. The other issue has been with CNS toxicity, and here dolutegravir has been particularly implicated, but in the cohorts that was particularly associated with abacavir use, which we'll touch on shortly.
The other issue, of course, has been the pregnancy safety signal for dolutegravir, though reassuringly that is no longer a significant difference, although numerically there remains a small increased risk of neural tube defects for women who are exposed to dolutegravir at conception. And finally, the weight issue, which I shall touch on. Now, there are some very key considerations before I move on. The first thing is the importance of placebo and comparator. So if you look at the Stribil first line studies and the prevalence of abnormal dreams at week 48, in the Gilead 102 study compared to a Favarin's blinded study, it was 9%. In the 103 study where Atazanaviratonavir was the comparator, it was 0%. So very different rates of abnormal dreams for Stribil depending on the comparator, thus illustrating the impact of placebo. There's also the importance of other drugs in the regimen, and here I use Gilead 1489 and 1490 to illustrate that point. Now, in 1490, both Bictegravir and Dolutegravir are with an FTC TAF backbone. So this is a head-to-head -head of the two integrases, but in 1489, Bictegravir is with FTAF, of course, but Dolutegravir is with a Bacodin and Mibudine. And if you look at the differences in nausea rates and insomnia rates, what you're really seeing there then is an impact of a bacavir. Yet if you look at 1489, sometimes that's interpreted as dolutegravir being a less tolerated regimen, but I think that's clearly mainly associated with backbone. The weight signal, I won't dwell on, it's been discussed an awful lot over the last couple of years, but here, this is a pooled analysis of eight Gilead first line studies, Bictegravir and dolutegravir associated with more weight gain than elvitegravir, and cohorts also show raltegravir less associated with weight gain than our second generation integrases. So in conclusion, the evolution of antiretroviral therapy has led to marked improvements in toxicity and tolerability profiles. One thing I didn't touch on, but I want to mention is incidence and point prevalence of adverse events over time should be standard. Presenting adverse events over one or two year periods without looking at how long those adverse events persist is not helpful when counselling patients. So I think we should encourage all trials to report adverse events in this way. As adverse events get less common, post-marketing surveillance, reporting events, and analysing events in cohorts becomes all the more crucial. And as new toxicities emerge, understanding the underlying mechanisms is key so that we can then assess new drugs in the same classes for their potential risk of those same side effects. So I'd like to end by thanking you for your kind attention. There are my contact details should you wish to get in touch, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Oh, Laura, thank you so much for your talk. Now, during my talk, I will emphasize the optimal use of nucleoside reverse transcriptase, translocation inhibitors, NRTTIs, and non-nucleoside regimens in routine clinical practice. Here are my disclosures. And now I'd like to sort of set out an agenda. Now, of course, because these aren't licensed yet, this is all theoretical in my own personal view, but I'm going to cover R to start with a two drug regimen, R to switch really mainly to avoid or because of side effects. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about drug interactions and tuberculosis uh, and the oral contraceptive pill, a little on pregnancy and HIV too. But there are really the limits to what I'm gonna say about these last two subjects, pregnancy and HIV too, is that we have no data on pregnancy and all we know is that is Latravir works for HIV too, but deravarine, which is the other part component of this, uh, has no effect. So what's the real advantage of being a two-drug regimen? Well, there have been increasing concern about other nucleoside toxicities. We had the Abacavir story and the Tenofovir DF story, which has now been uh, mitigated by the development of TAF. And also about the fact that if you're a 2DR and don't have a boosted agent, it limits drug-drug interactions. Obviously, cost is an issue. Uh, having two drugs should cost less than having three, but that's not perhaps always the case. And we don't know what the cost of any combination of an NRTTI and a non loop will be. Fewer drugs obviously may be a good thing, especially in the long, long term when people are on drugs for 40 years. And you know, we have this issue now with a lot of our cohort being aging, with multimorbidities, with polypharmacy. So perhaps having less drugs 
is a good thing, not only in terms of being able to take pills, but in also because of the drug interactions. Now, there are some limitations. So one is, and especially with the, the, the proposed NRTTI, a non nuke combination of these latrovir and duraverine, would be about hepatitis B co-infection. You'd have to screen for this first because of the inactivity of that combination against hepatitis B. We don't know about toxicities with new combinations that haven't uh, been discovered yet. And we've seen this with lots of drugs in the past that it can take several years before new things uh, are, um, are thought about. Uh, we've seen the weight gain with dolutegravir and TAF uh, and um, other issues with drugs that have taken a while for us to realize. The other thing is the access to resistance testing. If you're going to do a rapid start with this drug combination, is it safe to give the combination and get the resistance test later or not to do a resistance test at all? Globally, interactions with TB treatment is very, very important, especially with the rifamycins and other drug interactions. And I'm going to talk about this with the oral contraceptive pill are also important. Pregnancy, where well, we have no data, and that's very important uh, to have studies whereby we can see whether or not this is safe in pregnancy and also whether or not it's efficacious. Some drug levels of drugs go down in the third trimester in pregnancy, and there are others that are much more preferred because of their PK profile. We do have an issue though with high viral load and low CD4 with dual uh, two drug uh, therapies, and we really need to make sure that if we're going to start these therapies in patients with a very high viral load and the low CD4, that they will be efficacious. Uh, and most of these drugs really haven't been studied in patients with more than 500,000 copies in detail. Now, one advantage, of course, of having this uh, uh, combination was, is that it could be an oral fixed dose combination, which has been used in trials. At the moment, we've got two drug single tablet regimens of dolutegravir 3TC and dolutegravir ropivirine. All these others around uh, uh, the slide here are three drug regimens but you can see that we might be able to have an Islatrovir Duravarine, NRTTI and NNRTI combination, which again would be very useful for patients to be able to take one pill once a day. Now, let's talk about starting therapy with this regimen. So there are two ways to start. One is immediate start, and the world is moving towards, you've got a diagnosis, and almost on the same day or within a few days, you start antiretroviral therapy and there's gathering data that, that increases retention in care and has better outcomes but what would happen if you don't have a baseline resistance test or even a viral load or cd4 at baseline how useful uh, would this combination be in that in those situations so the concerns would be you have some transmitted resistance to non-nucleosides uh, or even to these latrovir and the combination wouldn't be effective also, if you started with a high viral load and low CD4, would this work? So um, in the immediate start scenario, I think we need a lot more data before we can actually say that we would start immediately with a combination like this. Now, what about a planned start? And many pa patients in the world, it's planned. You got your diagnosed, we're gonna get your blood test back and then we're gonna put you on the optimal therapy. Um, but the concerns then would be, if you had a high viral load and low CD4, even if you had a wild type virus, would this be effective? Well, we don't have much data, but I just wanted to talk about the naive data on Islatrovir plus Duravarine. Uh, and this is a quite a complicated um, a story in terms of a trial, but it's, uh, it's very logical. They started with three drugs of Islatrovir and Duravarine, but they added 3TC. So it's a three drug combination. And as a standard, they, they had the comparators Duravarine, 3TC, and TDF. And then at week 24, they, they moved, uh, if patients were undetectable, um, so this is an induction maintenance more than just a pure naive, they moved to a two drug regimen of Islatrovir Duravarine. And there are three of these here, all of different doses. So this is then saying, which dose should we choose ongoing? And again, they kept a comparator arm. Well, the results were pretty good with, uh, as you can see, uh, various rates of success. Um, and in interestingly, uh, this largest dose of Elatrovir had, had the, the, the less 
number of percentage uh, developing undetectability through week 48. Uh, and in fact, the dose they've gone for is a 0.75. But if we look at this, let's look at some of the um, patients that uh, had virological failure. Now, the first thing to say is, if you look, here's patient one, and we can see the baseline CD4 count. And then if we, as we move along here, you can see the viral load. And by week 16, you can see this patient became undetectable, but out of week 48, had a blip at 51 and a confirmed blip at 79. So is this actually a blip or is this early virological failure? And you can see this along all of, the, all of these patients. Now, um, one of the patients uh, um, actually changed here. This patient changed before, uh, sorry, this patient here changed uh, before they reached week 40, where they had the, the 103, it went up, and before week 48, where it went to 93, and, uh, and you can see the confirmed was just at 50 copies. So this patient actually switched therapy. These ones with the yellow were on the uh, original uh, randomized therapy after 24 weeks. Now, the interesting thing to note is that all of these viral loads are extremely low. That's the first thing. They're all in the, what we might think of as a blipping range. And then the second thing to say is that some of these had high viral loads at baseline. You can see 153, 626, and 437. So some of these had uh, quite high viral loads, which is an interesting concept uh, because I just want to come to this in the next slide. But And three of the six patients who then switched to a new re regimen still had low level viremia 42 days after the switch. And again, this comes to the fact that this could be a physiological phenomenon rather than a failure of the drug. And nobody met a criteria to get any resistance testing out of here because they needed to have more than 400 copies. So why did these patients, and some of them, as I've shown you, have high viral load, develop um, the, uh, the criteria for virological failure? Well, first of all, did they fail? So they just developed a high viral load, and if, uh, but, but interestingly, you know, um, we would have had to follow them on for a long period of time, and that wouldn't be ethical, so they had to switch. Was it just a blip? We know that about 4% of all viral loads are, are blips and they're often low level. But what you can say is on the confirmation of viral load tests, they didn't appear to be blips. They appeared to be true because the confirmation were all higher. Or could this be just virus coming out of the reservoir? And we've seen this in patients who have high viral loads that they can have this low level viremia or they can just dip below detectable and come up again for a long period of time. So I think we need to know that. But as I say, if we really want to know whether this combination works in high viral load, we need to uh, have a phase three study where those patients are allowed to be included. Uh, the CD4 question, low CD4, wasn't answered because you can see down here that the CD4s were actually all over 200. So that's uh, in, the, in the naive, although the data is from induction maintenance. What about using a combination like this in switch because of side effects? Now, what are the side effects of the day? And it's weight gain. That's the real uh, important side effect that everybody's been concerning themselves with. Obviously, CNS side effects are, are um, always important. And we had those with ephedrine, and then we had insomnia with the uh, dolutegravir uh, and the integrase inhibitors. But this weight gain with integrase inhibitors and uh, tenofovir alafenamide, TAF, uh, has been a concern. Um, we've also always concerned about lipid abnormalities. And the other reason for, for, um, for switching is um, people with treatment experience who, who don't have any resistance but want to simplify their therapy. So let's have a look at the adverse events through week 48. Uh, in, this, in the study that I've just shown you, the induction maintenance, it's not a switch study to show you the adverse events, but it's at least something that you might look out for. And in fact, they were very, very similar in terms of serious adverse event rates, uh, a few more with the triple therapy compared with the, the double therapy arm. And, uh, but as you know, they started off with triple, then went to double. And, but the, the most important one here was probably head, headache and diarrhea. But if you then look at the dose that they want to use, the 0.75, the headache compared with the three drug regimen and the diarrhea compared with the three drug regimen were very similar.
uh, and most of these events were mild, transient, and not thought actually to be related to the drug. They did see some elevated creatine, creatinine kinase, um, but no dose-related trends, and most of them were associated with physical as exertion and all resolved. And I remember from the early integrase days, we saw some of this, and again, it was probably the same thing, that people cycled to the clinic or ran or, or did some physical exertion, and then um, it was seen in the adverse events. So nothing, not, nothing really very different to the Durabrin 3TC uh, TDF uh, combination in triple therapy with the double therapy. Now, what about some metabolic changes? Well, you can see here, uh, um, and if you look at this, uh, this color here, the change in the glucose uh, from baseline, it's very small. This 3.4 is, is in uh, milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and if you think that this, that's about 0.1, so it's very, very little uh, in millimoles per litre. That's very, very little uh, change at all. And you can see the Duravarin uh, 3TC TDF uh, was slightly down, but the confidence intervals were wide. And if you look at the HDL to cholesterol ratio, the total cholesterol to the HDL ratio, um, you can see uh, there's very little change. This is mean change. It's 0 0.2, 0 0.3. It's basically, it, it goes down a little, but very little indeed, in fact. Now, what about the weight gain? Well, in the way they measured the weight gain here was more than 5% from baseline. And it's, it's a fair way of doing it because you want to see uh, whether a lot of people gain weight. And you can see from, um, from some of the data here that 16% uh, at week 24 for the triple versus the dose they're going to use was more at 40% here. Week 48, 36 versus 22.6. So this could be a signal that there's more weight gain with Islatrovir, Duravarine compared with the triple arm, or it may be some, again, some effect of TDF, which of course um, does not have the same effect as TAF, on weight gain from say the advanced study. So it's very interesting that it may be an effect of TDF here, keeping the weight down compared with there. Now, the weight gain, as I said, there's current concern with integration and TF. And what about, uh, what about this? And I want to come into the, 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 a little bit more detail about these Latrovia data, but let's just go to this slide here. Now, these are changes in BMI over time with HIV positive versus HIV negative. And they basically, they followed a lot of HIV patients from the Kaiser Permanente cohort over many years. You can see 12 years of follow-up here. And if you look at the HIV negative, they just followed this group up and they gained on average 0.06 kilograms per meter squared per year. So it went from 28.7 to 29.4 uh, in terms of their mean BMI. When you look at the HIV negatives who start, uh, HIV positive, sorry, HIV positives who started on treatment here, you can see they went from 25.8 to 28.4. And one of the theories here is basically that this BMI increase in the HIV positives on treatment was a return to health. Um, Though you can see this graph is still going up and this one is slightly going up and it would be very interesting if they can follow this cohort a little bit longer. So perhaps starting antivirals makes you put weight gain on because you're returning to health. Now, as I said, I wanted to just revisit this, uh, the weight gain on the Durabrini's Latrovia study. And here you can see um, uh, here's no change in weight. And here's the sort of scatter uh, at naught weeks at 12, at 24, and at 48 of the various different doses uh, of his Latrovia. And you can see they're really all grouped. There are a few outliers here. And I've already discussed that's the average change. But when you look at this, there really is very, very little difference between them in terms of groupings. Again, it's small numbers of patients. And I think really that um, we need much bigger studies. And it was interesting that most of this weight gain, and it's true, if you look at this graph and you look at this scatter part here, they're very, very similar. That most of it occurred between naught and 24. And that's why they think it may reflect a return to health phenomenon. But we, time will tell, we need to see the trials and we need to see how this pans out. Now, what about using this combination in people with treatment experience uh, and resistance. Now, if you're treatment experience and you've had a lot of problems with side effects and you're on uh, a complex regimen, you can see that you may be able to switch to this. 
but what happens if you have uh, treatment experience plus resistance? Well, this is interesting. This is Deravarine data that was uh, presented at the AIDS 2020 conference, uh, and they looked at all of these mutations. Now, it's well known that Deravarine is effective against K103N, but they also looked at these other uh, mutations that might have some significance with Deravarine, um, these different mutations and even combinations. And actually, if you look here, the fold change uh, was relatively low, all stayed below five. This one, one at Y181C and K103M went just above three. And here's the interquartile range. And I suppose the discussion here is if you have an interquartile range that goes above, say, three or four or reaches five, how confident are you that the drug's going to work? Um, and then they looked at this um, at various different NNRTIs here. And for example, uh, that if you're susceptible to Duravarine, very few people are, you know, susceptible, would also uh, be able to use a Travarine. Uh, but if you look at Duravarine here, uh, if you're on a Travarine and susceptible, um, you can see the cross reaction with Duravarine. So this was very interesting in table in that only 17% of people who would, Duravarine would work, uh, would actually uh, be a be susceptible to ephedrine. So Duravarine does have a very good uh, resistance profile. And I think this, this data is uh, reassuring in terms that if you see these other mutations, then um, you will have some effect. Now, is that trivia resistance is something different? There's been only emergence of resistance to that trivia in selected experiments. Uh, and what you can see is the M184, either I or V, and it's in, uh, um, causes 3.9 or five time fold um, reduced susceptibility compared with wild type. But what, they've, what the, the manufacturers have said is that the concentration you get as, of Azlatravir as at, at the clinical dose that we're going to expect should suppress these, these mutations and uh, should stop them from either occurring or if you've got them, be able to uh, overcome these. Um, you can see here from another table I've shown, it's effective against the K65R, which is very useful. EFDA was the old name for Islantravir. So we, but we have to wait and see. I mean, a study needs to be done in people with the 184I or B, with the K65R, et cetera, to ensure that this double combination is effective because what we don't want to do is to uh, generally use a combination in patients who have got background mutations uh, and, uh, and then find that we're giving effective monotherapy. Now I want to move on to another subject, which is for WHO, for their guidelines, is critically important is, could this combination be used in tuberculosis? Now, you can use these drugs with rifibutin. Well, uh, and so in countries where rifibutin is available and we can treat TB with rifibutin, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and uh, duravarine can be used as 100 milligrams BD with rifibutin. There was a, a poster at uh, AIDS 2020 outlining this, but you can't use duravarine with rifampicin or with rifapentine. Rifapentine is becoming a drug now of the future for prophylaxis. So duravarine can be used with that. And Islatravir doesn't interact with cytochrome P450 enzymes, uh, and so it uh, should be, be able to be used with rifabutin or rifampin. So um, a combination of deravirin is latrivir with rifabutin being used in tuberculosis is a potential yes. But most of the world uses rifam rifampin or rifampicin, and uh, therefore it's going to be difficult to use that combination in that the situation in most countries in the world. The oral contraception is uh, important, and there's been a study where duravarine, there's no significant interaction, and levonorgestrel and ethanol estradiol were not effective. So again, for women, uh, women who are on contraceptives, uh, it, it appears to be a good combination to be able to give uh, them without concerns that the drug levels of the contraceptives are going to be affected. So, We've gone through quite a lot of different ways that we might be able to use this drug, but as I say, we need the answers from clinical trials. So this is the so-called Illuminate Clinical Development Program for the NRTTIs and non-nukes, the Duravarine is Latrivir study. Uh, and you can see here the dose, 100 milligram with 0.75. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, data, hopefully, that will come out of a double-blind, heavily treatment experience program, 
uh, of two virologically suppressed, one with um, open label and one with double blind against uh, Big Tarby, Big Tegravir, uh, FTC, uh, and tenofovirallophenamide. So that will be uh, very interesting. Um, I always like to see double blind studies being performed. And then you can see a big treatment naive study against uh, uh, Big Tegravir, FTC, and TAF, again, double blinded. And then there will be a single arm study looking at uh, this in either treatment naive or virologically suppressed adolescents. And again, a drug with no very few side effects, which has few drug interactions, which is easy to take, uh, might be uh, of benefit to that particular group. Um, I will just add one other thing is that they're, they're aiming in this to recruit um, a large, large percentages of women into the studies, uh, which is very important because, uh, as you know, the history of HIV and drug development has underrepresented women quite greatly. So this will be important that, um, that, that uh, this is followed through. So in conclusions, potential route use. Yes, uh, a two drug fixed dose combination will be very welcome. As I say, we've got two at the moment. This will be a third. The side effect profile looks good, but we need more data. Uh, in terms of switching, we need to know more about the weight gain. It appeared that there was, uh, the numbers were a little larger in, in um, the, the dual therapy compared with the triple therapy, uh, but this, was, this may have all been a return to health by week 24. Um, um, lipids look pretty neutral as well as does the glucose. We've had no signal about CNS side effects. And in treatment experience patients with the resistance, that is really the study we need to know whether the, um, the deravarine um, poly, uh, polymorphine, I'm sorry, in, um, in reverse transcriptase and whether the 184V is going to affect this. We now have seen drug interaction data in tuberculosis and that rifabutin could be used, not rifampicin. Uh, we've seen the data on the oral contraceptive pill. Pregnancy, well, that's going to take a while to come. Uh, but we hope that they'll try and gather this data as soon as possible. And the last thing, HIV-2, is latrovir is effective, but deravarine isn't. So is latrovir as a single agent with other agents like boosted PIs or integrase inhibitors would be useful, but as a deravarine, um, is latrovir would not be. So the future is very interesting for this uh, combination of a new uh, a, a nucleoside analog and I think in the next two to three years, uh, we're going to be able to um, look back at and look at all the data and know exactly where to use this in routine clinical practice. Thank you. Well, okay, that was me. Um, <laughs> I asked how difficult to thank myself, but uh, thanks for listening. That's one thing. So now we're going to go into the Q and A. Um, thanks so much for wonderful talks. Uh, and I want to jump straight in, really. And it's all around um, weight gain. Let's start with the weight gain issue. So, if you and it actually comes in to what people have been putting on the questions about uh, about the use of deravarine. So, where there's going to be a lot of issues with weight gain and people perhaps wanting to switch. Uh, would be in lower middle income countries where the standard treatment at the moment is uh, with dolutegravir and in resource rich countries where we're using a lot of TAF. Now, if there's no baseline resistance testing, um, what do you think people should do? We had someone from Zimbabwe saying that they got 31% baseline resistance to NNRTIs and 138 is common. So, Chloe, maybe I can move over to you. I mean, originally from South Africa, so um, uh, uh, that's great because you know what's going on there uh, and the advanced study was done there. What do you think about lower middle income countries and the use of deravarine uh, for switching from weight gain? Yeah, it's a million dollar question, really, isn't it? Because I think what we don't know is the mechanism um, and we don't know whether switching therapy is helpful uh, and we don't, uh, we don't understand you know, quite why this is happening. And although there are some biological studies starting to happen and looking at the tissue and looking at the adipose tissue, it's also unclear. I mean, at, at Croy last year, we were for the first time talking about things like the obesogenic environment, we were talking about the new life of dystrophy. And there's so much data that's come out, there've been amazing analyses, but what we don't know is 
if you switch someone away from the drug, is it going to help? And if you look at the dry shift study, which was presented uh, last month at AIDS 2020, um, there wasn't a lot of weight improvement. Uh, there was a slight improvement um, relatively for those people switched away from integrase inhibitors. There was less weight gain, but there wasn't really improvement. There was less weight gain. So to be honest, I don't know what to say to this, this very good questioner. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if anyone on the panel has anything more to add. Uh, so Laura, uh, can I just come to you about switching when maybe there's a lot of background resistance and you want to switch because of weight gain and the driving data looks pretty good and these latrovir data looks pretty good? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging and obviously Chloe's absolutely right. We, we, we don't really know um, and we also don't know about the mechanisms. I guess one thing that really struck me about advance on the topic of resistance is, of course, baseline resistance testing wasn't undertaken. Uh, and yet the efavirenz arm was non-inferior to the two dolutegravir arms, despite very high rates of NNRTI resistance in that population. So, you know, I'm not saying resistance testing isn't important, and I'm not advocating necessarily the use of any lower barrier regimen in the absence of resistance testing. But one thing we can take from advance is efavirenz worked very well despite that. Um, in terms of switching, I mean, obviously a lot of dolutegravir use globally is with a, a TDF and lamivudine or FTC backbone. Um, and, and there, of course, we know that's a lower propensity. Again, whether you'd switch to duravirine or not, I think we need to get some evidence. But clearly in, res, in resource-richer settings where TAF is widely used, for many people, I would get rid of TAF and switch to TDF if someone was gaining weight. And of course, we'd have the option of resistance testing to guide switch to lower barrier drugs, including duravirine. Yeah, and you know, it was, uh, to come back to Chloe's point, Laura, I just wondered if you have a quick comment on this. Uh, people have been discussing on the blog here that it's we, we don't really know the mechanism of a lot of drug reactions or side effects. I mean, we have the Abacavir story, yeah. but even the molecular mechanism of that seems to have eluded people. And we have a little bit about the mitochondrial toxicity. Uh, so do you think we should have a lot more investment in this? I, I'm sure that I'm sure it's, that's a bit of a rhetorical question, but what, 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 what are your views? No, no, I think we absolutely should. And I think one of the one of the big problems has been is that the side effect emerged though with hindsight. We can see signals with with earlier studies, but the side effect emerged when it was too late to apply some of that sort of more mechanistic study um, to those drugs and those classes. So I think it must be an absolute priority going forwards. Um, I know uh, Viva done some work on on um, I've forgotten the name of it now, melanocortin receptors. But, you know, this is a, an area that's been much studied. There are many mechanisms which have been associated with uh, drug associated weight gain in the field of antipsychotics. And I think we're, we're really duty bound in, in the field of HIV to, to look at those known mechanisms um, and really start to understand. And unless we truly understand the mechanisms, then we're never going to really understand what the best options are for patients in terms of interventions, including switch. Yeah, and Jean-Michel, I mean, uh, um, these things are really important when it comes to prep for, uh, and with Islatrovir, the long, the long action of Islatrovir, um, you know, it wouldn't, it it's really means that we now, anything that's going to be long acting, we really need to get the profile right in terms of uh, um, um, side effect profile and how to deal with it. What, what are your views on that? I think you're right, and that's why I think for the uh, initial PrEP studies with this here, it, it's important that the study are double blind versus the standard of care. So we would really know the, what's the uh, safety profile of the drug. And, uh, you know, uh, the, these studies are planned. And, you know, it's quite exciting because of the long half life of Islatravir that we may have, you know, a, a, peel, a monthly peel for PrEP instead of a daily peel. And you know, uh, potentially also an implant once a year, and and clearly that's going to be exciting to look at the efficacy and you know uh, the safety as well. Uh, let's hope that the you know the, the safe, safety profile will remain as good as was reported so far. Um, and of course, we, we have to uh, give a close look at uh, at this trial and have the, the best design to be able to assess really safety. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I was quite intrigued by the, the post-exposure prophylactic data because it would be great if you could just take a single pill uh, if you're exposed and not have to have a course of pills. That, that's right. And I, and I think, you know, there is a continuum uh, from, you know, daily prep to on-demand prep to, uh, you know, a short post-exposure prophylaxis trial. Uh, 
uh, or, or regimen. And there are uh, interesting studies in macaque using macaque models. They have been quite reliable to predict what would be uh, happening in humans and uh, quite interesting models that you know would suggest that maybe a single peel before and uh, uh, or a single peel just after sex might be good enough for prep and pep and and you know the um, there, there is again a continuum between prep and pep and potentially you know in the future we may have much more simple uh, uh, pep regimen to uh, uh, to provide to to people. Yeah, I, I find it amazing that it's become a blurred zone now that prep could be pep <laughs> mm -hmm. and that um, you could, as long as you take it within a certain time of having sex, uh, you could be protected. And I think these drugs are really exciting around that, uh, around that concept. Uh, it's clear that in the macaque model, again, I couldn't show all the data that are available today, but uh, there are pap papers in, uh, you know, in press, but uh, interesting also uh, data presented at Croy. Uh, showing that maybe, you know, a, a single pill uh, that could be a combination of drugs, maybe integrase inhibitors have a place also here in PrEP or PEP regimen um, for short uh, regimen. And, you know, what, what seems to be important is to take the drugs very close to the sexual exposure, either a couple of hours before, a couple of hours after. You, um, you know, any slight review in that respect is uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. It would be challenging, though, to uh, design trial to look at, uh, you know, post-exposure uh, prophylaxis regimen. Uh, easier to do PrEP than PEP studies, but why not? Yeah, now, I, I mean, uh, I, uh, I want to just look, about, look at Islatravir, and it's an adenosine analog. So can you give it with tenofovir? I mean, I've been puzzling myself as to whether... Um, would that would it be like the, the the story of giving AZT D4T together? So, Chloe, have you got any thoughts about that? I mean, I, I don't know if they, I didn't see in their program that they were thinking of ever using um, Duravarine TDF is Um because you might think that's very sensible, especially if you've got some circulate maybe circulating resistance or or somebody who's had a one eight four before or something. But uh, um, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, some sort of antagonistic concept. Mm, yeah. yeah. Really interesting. It's it's a fascinating idea. Um, I mean, I guess sort of in terms of the strategy, they're, they're sort of focusing on a 2DR strategy with this latrovir. Um, and I guess that would mean 2DR tends to mean a TDF and a bacavir avoiding strategy or any sort of tenofovir and a bacavir avoiding strategy. So I'm not sure if anybody's thought about it. Um, but yeah, I think I think developing drugs as, as single agents, and I know they plan to develop it as one for weak agent, but I think developing the agents as, as as single agents is really important. And I think they did that with Derevan, and that was a real strength. And I think particularly because of HIV two, having Latrovir as an agent on its own, not together with other agents, in a potential to be given in a triple combination, would actually be very important for HIV two. Uh, because you would certainly need nucleosides and you may need other drugs as well. Um, so I don't know. I think that's an important and a very relevant question, particularly in terms of HIV-2. Now, in the program that they're developing, they're, they're doing a lot of uh, comparisons with uh, Bictegravir as an integrase. Yet when they when they uh, first started to investigate the ravarine with TDF three TC, they didn't do an integrase comparison. Laura, do you think that this slowed down our uptake of of the ravarine, uh, because we didn't Ooh. have that comparison? Do you think it was was a problem at the time? Um, I mean, so I think at the time it, it, they used the comparators that were standard at the time, didn't they? And it's easy to look back and say, yes, she should have done this. It certainly, is, as, as Chloe said in her talk, has been a, a limitation um, for deravarine is the lack of study against integrases. Um, I, I can, in terms of has it been a barrier, I, I don't know what the uptake has been in the rest of the world, um, hiding in the bubble here uh, in the UK. But I can tell you in England, this is not a barrier. I think in England, no. we've always had a good relationship with NNRTIs. Um, and certainly the fact that we've long held on to TDF and FTC being a preferred backbone where it's clinically appropriate. TDF, 3TC and deravarine co-formulation is, is flying off the shelves at, at home. Yeah. Uh, so in England, no. Uh, the rest of the world, I don't know. Um, and I think obviously with hindsight, an integrated comparison would be good. And there's still time to do one, of course. It's never too yeah. late. Never too late. No, I mean, I always said it would have been a good thing to have 
to have done because the gold standards were moving towards integrase. But actually, you're right. In the UK, we're, we're using a lot of um, deravarine, uh, and uh, it's very well tolerated as far as we can see. And for those people who can't take TDF, we, we can combine it with TAF or with Abacavir. Uh, Jean-Michel, um, uh, uh, studies uh, with integrase as, as gold standard, um, what do you think, you know, the, the, I, I want to really come back to um, issues of trying to tease out side effect profiles. I mean, do you think now that we should get uh, DEXA scans apart from just measuring the BMI and we should really be looking at percentage fat and, and, and everyone have something embedded in it around, uh, around weight gain mechanisms and, and do more fancy lipid measurements? What, what do you think we should be doing now in gold standard clinical trials? Because we've got, and especially in long acting, imagine, I'm not saying this does, but we, we get a long acting drug that we find affects some met metabolic phenomenon and, and it's going to last a year. No, you're, you're right. This is a matter of concern right now. Uh, although I think we need to bring to the discussion experts in lipids and in fat tissue. And, you know, some people are advocating the use of uh, uh, tissue biopsies to look at, the, uh, you know, the fat before and after uh, drug exposure. And, and, and clearly, um, since this is an emerging concern, we, we need to address that. And uh, almost all trials now that are being uh, considered uh, are, um, you know, have a, a sub-study looking at these issues. So beyond DEXASCAN, looking at body weight and, and measuring body weight is not that easy because, you know, uh, we have to make sure that the, the scale we use is reliable, that, uh, you know, the way we uh, weight patients is uh, also similar. So we, we need probably also to uh, improve uh, the way we measure the body weight and, yeah. and look at this, uh, um, uh, at this issue. Okay, uh, Chloe, the <laughs> I keep bringing up the hepatitis B issue because I think this combination is great uh, as a as a double combination. It's got real great promise. But where do you th what, what I mean in, in our countries we don't even get managed to test everyone for hepatitis B. We see all these studies from from Europe, the USA, where people fall through the net. Um, do you think this is an opportunity for us? And, and I think when we've got the other the other two single fixed pills, we've got dual drugs to really push hard on the hepatitis B front. Yeah, I do think it is. And I think that, you know, even in the Cavategoria program, um, there were a couple of breakthrough hepatitis cases, people who hadn't completely, uh, their vaccine hadn't completely taken. So between time of vaccination and screening and baseline uh, and various other uh, cases of things that have slipped through the net. And I do think it's a very important issue. And we, I think that with two drug regimens, it's critically important that we, we, we do this. And, you know, many of the, many of the adverse events in the FLAIR study and in the other uh, studies, uh, the other cavitagra studies were in fact hepatitis B. So it is an important issue. And yeah, I, that's I, would, I would like to, you know, uh, echo what Chloe was just saying. And I think for these studies where you have the rabbinist latrovir or Capitagravirvilpivirin, where you don't have any activity against HPV, you uh, you know you, you fear HPV reactivation or HPV acquisition because these people are at risk also of sexual acquisition of HPV. So uh, you know you know the, the, the right thing or the right way to use these drug in my mind would be to make sure that these people have um, anti-HPS antibodies before receiving these drugs. It's not enough to be vaccinated. It's, it is uh, important to make sure that antibodies are detectable. Yeah, and I suppose, Laura, for the final comment, with PrEP, with these drugs, the same again, if you're going to give PrEP check that they're going to be immune, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the, the advantages of, of, of PrEP and at the moment, although there's discussion and move towards dispensing six monthly supplies, because we've been providing PrEP primarily within sexual health services every three months, it's that opportunity to get the vaccine course completed, a screen for other STIs, and of course, as Jean-Michel said, checking the immunity after vaccination to ensure they are indeed immune. All right. Well, thanks for that. I'd like to thank you all for being a fantastic panel. And uh, the, the questions from the audience, thank you so much for those. They were very challenging for us, but uh, um, we um, uh, hopefully we, we've managed to answer most of them. Uh, and again, thank you for your time and wonderful talks. And yours, Anton. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks Anton. very much indeed. So I'm going to wrap up now and just say that we, we've heard a lot about Duravarine and his Latrovia. Uh, and about their, their um, clinical utility, 
potentially. And I think it's fantastic that we've come from a phase when people said, oh, well, do we need any more new drugs? But actually we do. Uh, and we've got uh, an NNRTI that's active against resistant mutations and is very well tolerated. And we've also got a new drug with a new mechanism, which may pave the way for, for others to come as well uh, to develop drugs that are similar and could be synergistic uh, with, with Islatrovir. And also it's long acting. So that's great. And we had a great review about um, problems with, with drugs, with complications, side effects and, and issues. And I think that we've really got to keep this in our mind. And, and actually that uh, I was sort of trying to allude to the fact that the bar is much higher now in drug development when it comes to monitoring for side effects and uh, resistance. Um, I'd now um, uh, like to say that we're going to do a survey at the end of the um, at the end of this, which is um, uh, I hope you can all fill in and uh, and give us your views about what's going on uh, because that's really important to us. Uh, and um, we can by doing by using that we can help plan other programs for you. So that will come up after the conclusion of this. Uh, and then I'd like to thank uh, MSD uh, for sponsoring this meeting. Uh, but we at uh, Virology Education had the responsibility for the content and the speaker selection. And it's really at the end of this, just for me to say uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and we hope to see you again shortly at another webinar. I'd like to thank one more time the panel for being superb and for answering all the questions. Thank you and good morning and good afternoon and good evening.